Hi everybody, hope you're well. Today we'll read an article by Françoise Fromono titled Miss Van der Rohe's Paradoxical Legacy, published in Oase 112. Current debates on the aesthetics of ecological architecture all too often seem polarized between two camps. For the first, design concerns must focus on environmental issues, climate control, energy saving, etc., and whether embracing high-tech, zero-energy design or biomorphic design produce buildings that perform and look like they do. The second understands sustainability as the capacity of a building to last physically, programmatically and culturally. Consequently, its proponents advocate indeterminate or flexible plans, reasonable construction and economy of means in all respects. The discourse underpinning these respective positions is still structured around a series of familiar oppositions, performance, permanence, machine, type, invention, convention, that are more or less derived from the opposition between functionalism and rationalism. A closer look at the reception and fate of a small modernist building, one that is generally associated with the latter trend, could open up unexpected perspectives beyond this fault line. Miss van der Rohe's Farnsworth House 1945-1951 in Plano, Illinois. The historical process by which Miss Mute abstract universal architectural statement was converted into a template for situated environmental living provides an intriguing if singular example of how the predicament described above can be overcome. A recent book by American fiction writer Alex Beam brought to a wide audience, almost as a novel would but using archival research, the story of the multifaceted architectural partnership between Miss Van der Rohe and Edith Farnsworth. After she met Miss in 1945, and while his project for her now famous country house was taking shape, the cultivated and conventional research physician was enthralled by the ideas of the German architect and, according to Beam, excited at the prospect of midwifing them as the enlightened patron she undoubtedly was. Her relationship with Mies started deteriorating with the uncontrolled rise of the project costs. Minimalism was never cheap, and with what she perceived to be Mies disregard for concerns other than the conceptual and material coherence of his overall design. When she finally took possession of the finished house in 1951, Farnsworth was to show no tolerance for the impediments caused by Miss' neglect of practicalities and comfort. Their argument ended up in court. Reflecting the client's mixed feelings of exhilaration and frustration with this glass case, the initial reaction to the house in architecture circles was divided, and in a way it still is. On the other hand, it was hailed as a pervasive built theory, the epitome of Miss Dictum less is more, of his definition of building a structure, of his conception of the open plan, and of his classical romantic shinkle inspired idea of the relationship between architecture and nature. Art does not derive from the imitation of nature, but from mathematics as the basic harmony of forms and arithmics. On the other hand, and perhaps consequently, this primitive hut for the industrial age was resented as being unsuited for living, literally anticlimactic, and proof of the deceptiveness of masterpieces and the vanity of manifestos. Indeed, the list of tangible problems generated by Mies' radical concept was endless. Wrapped in a sealed glass envelope with little ventilation and without air conditioning, the house was extremely hot in summer except under the porch, where mosquitoes were so ferocious that Farnsworth had its three sides enclosed with mesh screens. Until these were removed in the 1970s by the next owner of the house, Peter Palumbo, pictures show the visual damage this insertion inflicted on the floating extension of the two horizontal planes so carefully proportioned by Miss. 
The house was no more comfortable in the icy winters of the Midwest, even at the expense of astronomic heating bills. Its envelope was entirely made of 6.5 mm single glazing, with a thermal bridge at every connection between the frames and the exterior columns, and without floor or roof insulation. The floor heating system and an inadequate oil furnace concealed inside the service core generated intense condensation on the glass and even under the lights. Reluctantly surrendering to Edith's demand, Miss had added a minimal fireplace on the living room side of the central core, but as the interior space was almost hermetically sealed, it never worked properly. Designed as a static viewing device geared towards an almost metaphysical contemplation of the landscape's shifting beauty, the glass pavilion provided no intimacy. I feel like a prowling animal, always on the alert, Farnsworth confessed. If you view nature through the glass walls of the Farnsworth house, it gains a more profound significance than viewed from the outside, Miss would later lecture at a distance. He had nevertheless underestimated the threat of this nature that the architecture of the house was supposed to both reveal and keep at bay. The Fox River was notorious for its sudden seasonal surges. In order to compensate for the somewhat inconsiderate sighting of the glass pavilion, on the lower part of the terrain, only 100 meters or so away from the bank for the river to be in sight, Miss had raised it 1.5 meters above the ground, supposedly at the highest known watermark, thus bestowing an eerie monumentality upon the house. In time, this move would prove insufficient to protect the house against the periodic flooding of the river, a problem accentuated over the years by the rapid urban development of the Fox River Valley. The Threat to the Next America Elizabeth Gordon, editor of the hugely successful House Beautiful, famously wrote in a scathing eponymous piece published two years after the house was completed. If Gordon's reactionary argument was essentially charged with nationalistic overtones, it also picked on the environmental shortcomings of Miss Aquarium. And yet, no other modernist house has had a comparable fortune as a model. In the following years and up to the present day, dozens if not hundreds of architects have proposed their own version, completed with programmatic, spatial, technological and, most importantly here, climatic and environmental improvements of their own. Here, a few standout projects are extracted from a potential corpus of many other cases. They exemplify the process by which the Farnsworth House, once stripped by its admirers of the cerebral, arcane philosophy of architecture that had informed its original aesthetics, became an ubiquitous formal basis for various cultures of environmental living. As it appears, the transformation of the Farnsworth House into a beacon of eco-architecture did not happen in spite of its environmental flaws, but thanks to them. Exploiting the possibilities of similar commissions, architects have picked up on the potency of its reductive design, while transforming it as far as its founding principles allow them to. This generation of all sorts of architectural variations in time and space has made Miss prototype into an archetype and, in these respects, its global success validates its claim to universality. Ask for Oase at your local bookstore. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video. Bye.